Amen. All right. Tonight I'm going to be preaching on the subject of complacency in the Christian life. I'm going to get a little bit more specific than that in just a moment. But I picked the ideal passage of the, the, the Christians that everyone thinks of in the Bible who were complacent. They were complacent Christians. And of course it is the church of Laodicea. I want you to look here with me at verse number 14. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Of course, that's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ being the Word of God. Look at verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot, so then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So notice that he says, when God looks at this church, he says, you're neither cold nor hot. What does he say? He says, you're lukewarm. He's referring to the fact that they are complacent. They are content with where they are in their Christianity. Look at verse number 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich. So notice the contentment here, the complacency with what they have currently. I am rich and increased with goods. And have, look at this, need of nothing. They're saying, I don't need to grow. I don't need anything. I'm good where I'm at. And have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched. Now this is the true status of what they're in. Wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And then he gives them the remedy. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So as I said, I'm going to be preaching on complacency in the Christian life. But more specific than that, I want this sermon to benefit you to be able to prevent complacency before it really sets in. I'm going to be preaching about spotting the, the signs of com complacency. Spotting complacency early or spotting complacency and the signs of it right before it comes. So I want to get very specific this morning. I want you to go, or this evening, go to Luke chapter 12. Go with me to Luke chapter number 12. So Laodicea, of course, people will say today, hey, you know, we're in the Laodicean church age. Those that believe in, uh, you know, dispensationalism, they'll look at the seven churches and try to say, hey, these are the seven dispensations. And they, they believe, of course, in the pre-tribulation rapture. And they say, hey, we're in the last dispensation, right before Christ comes back. And that is the Laodicean church age. And the reason why they say that is because churches today are more complacent than they've ever been. People and Christians and churches today are more complacent than they've ever been. I've been to so many Baptist churches. I have multiple uh, uh, cousins. I have multiple family members that actually are pastors of Baptist churches. And I've seen these churches go up. I've seen these churches go down. I've visited numerous churches. I've been a Baptist my whole life. I've been to a lot of revivals. I've seen Baptist churches my entire life. And I can testify to you that we are living in the late... No, I'm just kidding. That churches today are complacent. Of course, that's junk, you know, to say that we're living in the Laodicean church age. You know, dispensationalism is false. You know, the Laodicean church age is stupid. There was a literal church where at that time, guess what? There was, there was six other churches that they weren't struggling with this specific problem. Yeah, they had their own problem, but they weren't necessarily struggling with complacency, were they? There was one church that was struggling with complacency. Now, we look around today... And it seems like a lot of churches are complacent. And the reason why they, that this fits their narrative is because now they can just keep being complacent. They can just say, hey, well, we're, just, we're just in the Laodicean church age. That's bunk. That's a bunch of crap. That is, that's not biblical. There is no church age. That's ridiculous. You know, uh, the Bible teaches that there should be glory to the Lord Jesus Christ throughout, in the church throughout all ages. That shows that the church is in all ages. There is no church age. It's stupid and silly. So people will try to find excuses for their complacency. But us as Christians, we should not be satisfied, which is the definition of complacency. We should not be satisfied with our Christian life, right? That is the definition of complacency. To be satisfied with one's performance or to be satisfied with one's achievements or status you know, in, in, at this point in their life. 
And as Christians, you should never be satisfied with where you are as a Christian. If you look at your Christian life and you're happy with where you are, with your Bible knowledge, with how much Bible you have memorized, with, with, and oftentimes we, we focus too much on the knowledge of the Bible and we don't focus on actually applying the characteristics of the Bible. You know, we, we don't talk about, you know, you know, are you being more charitable lately? Are you being more hospitable lately? You know, are you getting covetous out of your life more and more? Are you, being, are you trying to be less envious in your life and things like that? You know, we should never be satisfied in any area of our Christian life. And the reason why is because you're never going to stop sinning. So your whole life, the, when you take your last breath, you're still going to be a sinner. Every one of us will still have sin in our lives. So what we should be doing, as opposed to being complacent, living a sinful life, and, and, and not being perfect, which we never will, but we should try to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to achieve that, what we should be doing is continually purging the sin out of our life and continually moving forward. Complacency is the exact opposite. Saying, hey, I'm just happy where I am. Let me promise you this, friend, that if you look at your Christian life and you say, hey, I'm happy with where I am, God's not happy with you. I can promise you that. If you look at your Christian life and you say, hey, I think I'm, I'm a good enough Christian right now, I can promise you that God is not happy with your Christian life. And God wants more out of you. Do you know what you are? You're a Laodicean. Christian is what you are. When you, know, when, when, when you look at yourself and you think that you've, you've arrived and that, and that you have achieved you know, uh, greatness, you have other sins that are in your life at that point. Pride and other things like that. That's the reason why you would be thinking that in the first place. Complacency is something that abounds in Christianity. It abounds. I've been in, I want to say this, I'm going to move out of the introduction after this point. I've been in Baptist churches my whole life. And they're all almost the same. All of them. Churches that have been around for 40, 50, sometimes 30 years, something along those lines. You walk in, it's normally about 100 people. They're roughly 90 to 100 people, sometimes 75. Of course, some churches are larger. Some churches are thriving. Some churches aren't in, you know, the Laodicean church age, right? You'll walk in and it's about the, it, almost about the exact same amount of people, most of them. 75 to 100 people, roughly, right around that. Uh, normally, it's like 75% above the age of 60, Right? And it's just these older men, older women, they come in, they're real friendly, they shake each other's hand. There, there's no work being done, there's no soul winning. They have a few events a year. They come in and they listen to a motivating sermon. But the people have been the same for 20 to 30 years. Nothing has changed in their Christianity. They have plateaued. They got saved, they read their Bible, they got to a certain point. Almost every Baptist church, they climbed this little hill. And then they looked around and everybody's about at the same point. So then they plateaued and just continued being the same Christian. If you looked at that guy's life, that older man, 75 years old, everybody can think of people that I'm talking about, right? Churches you've went to and you can think of these types of people. 70 years old, 75 years old. He was at the same point in his Christianity when he was a 50-year-old man. He was at the same point in his Christianity, most of them, when they were 45, 40 years old. That's sad, man. That is not who I want to be. I want to be... You know, an astronomically greater Christian in 30 years. I want to look back at myself, you know, at, at the ripe age of 29 and say, man, you know, I know way more Bible. I'm a much greater Christian than I was at that time in my life. I don't want it to be said, hey, 30 years has went by that I've lost in my, of, of, of my life and I'm exactly the same status Christian that I was then because I've just been complacent with where I'm at. We should never be complacent as Christian. So I want to give you the major signs of complacency. And there's here, right here, what I'm getting ready to show you now, it's, it's a parable, but it's a perfect, a, just a perfect description of a man that is complacent. Look here with me at Luke chapter number 12, verse number 16. Jesus, of course, and he spake a paral, parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. So he's going to do a little bit of work and then notice this, verse number 19. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Then he makes this statement right here. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Do you notice what he said, that phrase there? 
It says, take thine ease. What does that mean? Relax. Just be happy with where you're at. So he, he, everything came forth and it brought forth plentiful, right? He, he, you know, it brought forth abundantly, a massive amount, right? It says that this man was rich already. So what he, what he does with everything that he has, he says, what am I going to do? He said, I'm going to tear down everything that I have now, all the structures that I have now, and I'm going to build a new structure where I can put all of this in there, right? All, all of my goods in this one storehouse. Is he going to go out and do more work so that he can put more in there? No, 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 no. He's going to tear them all down, build a new structure, take all the fruit that he got from that year, place it in there, and then what is he going to do? He's going to sit back and relax. And then it makes this statement, take thine ease. That's the attitude of most Christians today. Take thine ease. You know what they are? They're happy. You know, and, and, and you should be, but they're, they're happy that they've gotten out of maybe the old life that they were in. They got out of the sinful life that they were living. They're happy maybe that they built some character and they have more stability in their life now. Following the virtues and the principles of Christianity, right? It will, you know, help you to be maybe not prosperous like I was speaking of last week. You know, sometimes there's exceptions. Some people can become prosperous as far as wealthy and rich, right? As a Christian, which, you know, having riches is not sinful. You know, you know loving riches and loving money, that's sinful. And desiring to be rich, that's sinful. Sometimes Christians are blessed with great wealth. There are many examples of it in the Bible. You know, you have Abraham, Job. There's many other examples, right? So that's not wrong. But oftentimes what Christians will do, they'll live a very rough life. They'll get saved, or they, you know, they may not even be poor, but they live a rough life in general. They get saved, or maybe they just you know, start living as a Christian. They start getting right with God in their lives. And then there's a certain point after you know, five years, ten years, different point in different people's lives, where they just sit back and they say, you know what? I've got a lot of stuff, man. My life, I really, everything in my life, and not just material things. Like I have a wife. I have children. You know, maybe material wealth as well. I have all these different possessions. You know what they say? Just like the certain rich man said, I'm just going to take my knees. I'm just going to sit back and relax. What are, they, what are they? They're happy with where they are. That's what he's saying. That's why he says, eat, drink, and be merry. He's saying, I'm just going to enjoy this. I'm going to sit back and relax, and I'm happy with what I have. That is the definition of a complacent person. What do they want to do? They don't want to do work. They just want to take their ease. They're happy with where they are, and they're just going to relax the rest of the way. I want you to go with me to, I believe it's the Old Testament now, Proverbs chapter number 30, verse number 9. So notice there that complacent man. What was he? He was a rich man. Now, Revelation chapter number 3, where we were before, what were they? They were wealthy, weren't they? Made it sound as if they were. Revelation chapter number 3, it says, verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods... And it says this, and have need of nothing. The, the number one sign, and this is one thing I'm going to be harping on over and over and over again here, the number one sign before complacency comes or the cause of complacency is normally physical riches, it's physical wealth in the Bible. This is repeated over and over and over again. So you guys have nothing to worry about. No, I'm just kidding. But this is normally the sign. Oh, yeah, I mean, we're going to see the consistency here over and over and over again. We see the epitome of complacent Christians, Laodicea. What do they say? They say, for thou sayest, you know, I am rich and have need of nothing, right? What about the man that was complacent there? He said, take thine ease. Said unto his soul, Soul, thou hast you know, many goods laid up for many years, right? Take thine ease, right? What was he? He was a certain rich man. I want you to look here at Proverbs chapter number 30. Let me get there myself. Proverbs chapter number 30, verse number 9. You'll see the same thing here. Proverb, Proverb chapter number 30, verse number 9. <clears throat> look at, first let's, let's read verse 7. We'll read the whole context here. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and, li vanity and lies. Then he says this. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food, he says, convenient for me. He's saying whatever is good for me. Notice why though. Verse number 9. He says, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? So you notice that? What did he say? He said, lest I be full and then he says, and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Why did he do that? Because he feels like, hey, I am rich. 
you know, and, and have need of nothing, right? He says he's full. What's he speaking about? Having great riches. I want you to see this again. Look at the, uh, go to Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Look at the warning that God gave unto the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel, when they were being brought out of, you know, great distress, great, you know, troublous times, God warned them before they were brought into the land of promise, before they were brought into Canaan, which where they were going to receive, receive great blessings, God warned them beforehand what could happen. Look at Deuteronomy chapter number 8. Look at verse number 11. It says this, Beware, so this is a warning, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. Notice what Proverbs chapter 30 said as well. You keep that in mind. He said, Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? What, he, what is he saying? Who is the Lord? He's saying he forgot him. Right? So here we see, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, statutes which I command thee this day. Now I want you to back up and look at, we're going we're gonna to read down in this passage in its entirety. Look at verse number 7. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates. A land of oil, olive, and honey. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Saying they're going to have plenty. Thou shalt not lack any it, anything in it. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. Now watch this. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Now what's the command that he gives them? He says you're going to go in there and you're going to have everything that your heart desires, right? You're going to have pomegranates, you're going to have all the fruit, all the grain, all the water, the greatest of springs, the greatest of the land, everything that you could imagine. He says when you get in there, you're going to eat. And it's going to be enough where you're full, right? You're going to have enough to satisfy yourself. You're going to have enough to be full. And he warns them first, he says, when you do this, what you need to do is you need to bless the Lord. You need to bless God. Why? Because the proper response or reaction would be, hey, thank you, God, for giving me this. Thank you for giving me something that I didn't have. Thank you for this great blessing, right? When you're full, you should thank God for being full. You should be grateful and thankful for what God has given you. But notice what he says in verse number 11 now. Read that verse once more. He says this then, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command you this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwelt therein. And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied. Notice, doesn't this sound like a Laodicean? They're rich, they have need of, you know, of nothing, right? And, and all that thou hast is multiplied. Verse 14, Then thine heart be lifted up. And then he says, And thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Notice how he's putting emphasis on how he brought them out of a bad situation. And he's the one that gave them this greatness and all, this ble all these blessings in the first place. Look at verse 15. Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint, who fed thee in the, mil in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And then watch this, verse 17. And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. And then he says in verse 18, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for he, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he sware unto thy fathers as it is this day. So notice there that he talks about how he's the one that blessed them and how he's the one that brought them through all of these trials and all of these tribulations. And he's warning them and saying, hey, I'll tell you what a possibility is. This is a possible outcome, something that may take place once you get there and, I, and you actually partake in these blessings, you receive these blessings and then you're full. 
A possible outcome is what? You're going to become complacent. You're going to become content with things you have. And then what you'll do is you'll forget that I'm the one that gave you all the things that you have in the first place. That I'm the one that actually brought you there in the first place. Exactly the same thing that we see the writer of Proverbs 30 saying, right? He says, give me neither poverty nor riches. And he says, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Why? What's the warning here? It says that they do this because why? Their heart can be lifted up. Because their heart will become lifted up and they'll forget that it was the Lord that gave them these things in the first place. So this ties in with the sermon I preached a couple of weeks ago about our blessings that come from God. Anything that we receive as children of God we should be thankful that God gave it to us. Of course, we should be grateful. We, can, we should be content in any situation as far as our physical blessings. But while we are content with the things that we are given as far as physical blessings, worldly possessions and things like that on, our, on earth, we should not, we ought not to allow that to affect our spiritual walk and then to become complacent in our spiritual walk with Christ. I want you to look back at Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Oftentimes what people will do is they'll receive physical blessings. They'll receive all of these physical things. They maybe receive power in life and maybe some position of authority and they're exalted. And then they end up forgetting about God. Why? Because their heart is lifted up. Because they look around at all these things that they have and then they think, I don't need God. Look at all of these things that I have. What happens is they lose sight of their spiritual walk with Christ and they start focusing on the things of this world. Their heart you know, becomes uh, uh, fixated on the worldly possessions. The things of the world steals their heart, as opposed to, obviously, God should have our heart. That's what we should be focusing on. We should be, all, all the time, we should be thinking and focusing on where we're at spiritually. Not living our life fixated on, you know, you know uh, how we can get ahead in life. Just need to get a few more bucks. There's a guy that works with me that wants to start a company. And he, he, you know, I don't know why this number specifically, you know, hopefully he knows. But he, he needs $20,000, right? That's what he keeps saying repeatedly. And I mean every week. Literally. He's just talking about, I'm getting a little bit closer to my 20 grand. I'm getting a little bit closer to my 20 G's. I'm just that much closer this week to my $20,000, and I'm not kidding you, every time he says it to me, it's irritating, number one. But every time he says it to me, I think like, and this guy claims to be a pastor of a, of a Baptist church. Every time he says it to me, I'm thinking like, man, you are way too fixated, fixated on the things of this earth. You are just obsessed with the things of this world. We should not, you know, hey, there's nothing wrong with having goals. There's nothing wrong with having, you know, things that you want to do in life. But you better make sure that those things don't start stealing you away from God. You better make sure that whatever that personal goal that you have, whatever it may be, if it's your job, whatever it may be, even hobbies and interests. But obviously the fear of becoming complacent is tied in with, you know, uh, wealth and, and riches and power and things like that. You know why? Because it lifts your heart up. It lifts your heart up. When you get those things, oftentimes you just think, well, I earned this myself. And then you forget the Lord. What, is, uh, what does Nebuchadnezzar do? You know, God gives him a warning that he's, gonna, he's going to, he's going to uh, uh, lower him. He's going to humble him, doesn't he? And then when that moment actually happens, he, he's walking in the tower, right? He walks out and he looks at his kingdom. And what does he say? He says, all these things is, is my hand built. I've built all these things, doesn't he? And what happens? God, right at that very moment, takes his sanity from him, doesn't he? He humbles him, right? He, he wants to show him that, hey... You know, I can take, I can take this from you. I, the whole world is in the hand of God. Every, every, you know, ounce of gold, he owns it. And as God tells him, God decides who has the kingdom. God's the one. He, he can shuffle things around. He can take th things from you in a moment. That's a heathen pagan king. How much more does he intervene in your life as a Christian? How much more does he care when you get to a point in your life where you think, hey, I earned this. I got myself to this point. I want you to look here at Deuteronomy chapter number 6. See this same warning. Deuteronomy 6, verse 10. Chapter 6, verse 10. <clears throat> it says, And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, 
He says, to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not. Notice how he puts that emphasis there too. That's important. And houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not. And wells digged, which thou diggest not. Vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then he says in verse 12, then beware, so this is a warning, then beware lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. Now in a very literal sense, God gave them these things. In, 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 in an extremely literal sense, right? Because they didn't build any of these houses, literally, right? He brought them in, of course, and they, there were ten cities total that they were to conquer. The very first one was what? Jericho. Jericho. And that was God's. There's the tithe being taken out. Then there was nine that came after that, and they got to possess all of that land, right? The first one they didn't touch. That's the Lord's, and he actually says that. That's the tenth. Then there's the, no, the other nine, and the Israelites got to keep that. They went in and they slew everyone that was there. And guess what? There were existing vineyards that were there. There were existing houses that were there that other people had already built. Right? There were existing wells that were already dug, operating wells. Just got to get the bucket, pull your water up. They had to do no work for it at all, period. Just go, they just had to fight for it and the Lord fought for them. So they went in and they possessed these lands. And he said, and you're going you're gonna to be able to eat of the fruit of the land, Right? You're going to eat of the fruit of the land? And he says, but beware. Because what's going to happen or what could happen is you could get these, this, this, these wells. You could get all of this food. You could get all of the, you know, eating the bread, right? From, the, from uh, you know, all of the land that's already been plowed and sowed and everything. You start eating this and enjoying this, beware. Because what you could do is your heart could become lifted up. And you can get to a point where what? You're complacent with what you have. That's what it means to be full, right? Say, I have enough. You're complacent with where you're at. You're content with where you're at. You know what you end up doing? Forgetting God. You forget about God. What is the Christian doing that's complacent with his Christian life? He's forgetting about God. That's ultimately what he's doing. He's saying, hey, I don't need God. I don't need to move any, you know, any more further in my Christian walk. I'm good with where I'm at. I don't need anything else. That's what he means. I'm good. I don't need anything else. That's the Christian that is complacent in his life. That's exactly what he warned the Israelites of. So if, if they, when they literally had things already built, they literally had wells already dug, they literally had vineyards that were already planted and ready and they didn't have to do any work for it, if they can become complacent, how much more when you have to go do the work how much more can your heart be lifted up when you, when you actually have to go do the physical work? Yes, God gives you the strength. And that we definitely purge that from this as well. But they did less than we do. They did even less you know, of, of the work that needed to be done than we do. Right? Physically. How much easier would it be for you to become complacent in your life? You know, the first, every time you know what the warning is? When you start to be, have physical riches on this earth. When you start to have physical wealth. Do you know what can happen? You can become full. And you know what you'll do? You'll deny the Lord. You know why? You just say you don't need Him anymore. Say, I'm good. What were, the, what were the Laodiceans telling God? They're saying, hey, I have need of nothing. I don't need what you have for me. They're saying, I don't need your gold. I don't need your white raiment. I don't need your eye salve. He's saying, because they're saying, I have gold. I have all of these things. I'm clothed, right? And he's saying, no, you're not. You actually need these things that I have. But they think they're good. It's a perfect picture of, of, of just a, uh, a, a Laodicea in the Old Testament. Spiritual Laodicea. That's what we have here with the Israelites. How they're going to become complacent at one point, aren't they? Just like the church of Laodicea ha had come. I want you to look at uh, uh, Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah chapter number 9. Nehemiah chapter number 9. We'll see this again. How Nehemiah looks back. And sees that this, you know, this came to fruition. Excuse me, goodness. <clears throat> it came to fruition. Nehemiah chapter number 9, verse number 24. 
Look at verse 23 first. Their children also multipliest thou as the stars of heaven, and broughtest them into the land concerning which thou hast promised to their fathers, that they should go in to possess it. Verse 24, So the children went in and possessed the land, and thou subduest before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gavest them into their hands, and their kings, and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they would. And they took strong cities, and a fat land. It means a full land, right? It's a full land. There's a lot of blessings there. And possessed houses full of all goods. Can you imagine going into the land and saying, hey, I want that house. Just walking into whichever house you want and it's already furnished. There's already food in it. It's already, there's already beds there. That's what happened. It says, full of all goods, wells digged, vineyards and olive yards, and fruit trees in abundance. And then it says this, so they did eat and were filled and became fat. What's that mean? They became full, right? Became fat. They had what they needed. And delighted themselves in thy great goodness. So initially what did they do? They were thankful, weren't they? But look what it says. After a period of time, verse 26, Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee, and cast thy law behind their backs, and slew thy prophets, which testified against them to turn them to thee. And they wrought great provocation. Therefore thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies. And then he goes on and on and on and so forth, speaking of the punishment that God tells them in that chapter of Deuteronomy 8 that they're going to receive if they do this. But notice what happened, exactly what God said would happen. Notice how that actually came to fruition. What was the reason? Because they became fat. Because they became full. God handed all of this great goodness to them, didn't He? Now, a couple of weeks ago, I preached about all the great blessings that we have as Christians. As we ha as all the great blessings that we have just as Americans. Citizens of America living in modern day America. Just how our cup runs over, right? Our cup runneth over like David said. We have an abundance. We probably have more. When God is talking here about the Israelites having an abundance, almost certainly you have more than what the, the average Israelite had at that time. Can you imagine that? So if that caused them, with what possessions they had, to become fat and full and then their heart to be lifted up and to forget the Lord, how much more is it possible for you to do that today? How much more is it possible for you to do that as a Christian? Not only, of course, can you, and I, I, I want to make this quick point as well, but not only is it just from you know, physical um, uh, blessings that God can give, but you know sometimes people uh, can grow in intelligence, sometimes people can grow in wisdom. The Bible says this, knowledge puffeth up. You know, so even, you know, it can be general knowledge. In, in, in any case, I mean, you've met people that don't know the Bible that well. Uh, you know, maybe a saved person, maybe even an unsaved person who just stepped totally out. Just secular wisdom, secular knowledge. You'll meet people all the time that are puffed up because of how smart they are. All the time. I bump into people, you bump into people that are just, they're extremely, you know, they're an intellect. They're very, very smart with just, just a lot of just random wisdom and random knowledge. Are they normally the most humble person you've ever met in your life? No. They're extremely proud, aren't they? Extremely proud, right? You know, and the same thing can happen with us in other areas of life. The same thing can happen with us, I'm sorry, as far as like other whiz, types of wisdom, the th same thing can happen with us, growing in knowledge of the Bible. That can cause you to become puffed up, right? Knowing the, the, the more you grow as a Christian, and all the knowledge that you learn and the wisdom that you learn from the Bible, you know what you can do? You can get to the point where you're like, man, I am like a Bible scholar. James White doesn't have nothing on me, right? You could just think like you're just the, the greatest you know, Christian that has ever lived. People get to this point. There are people that are Christians today that are walking around that think that they're top dog Christian. They, these kind of thoughts go through people's minds, right? You know, they, 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 they think, hey, I know the Bible better than anyone. I, I've never met anybody that knows the Bible as much as I know it, right? There are people that live that, that, that get to this point, this puffed up, right? Where they just... They grow in wisdom, they grow in knowledge, and they think, look at me. But who gave you that wisdom? Where did you get that knowledge from? Did you go build that yourself? 
Or was it all written out and laid out in a book that you just had to read? Was it pretty much handed to you? Not only that, not only is it God's wisdom and did He build that house for you, He was the one that guided you there through the wilderness with the Holy Spirit. He had to give you His Holy Spirit to guide you into that truth, to guide you into those spiritual blessings, didn't He? So you see how foolish it is for a saved person to become puffed up of how much Bible knowledge they have when this is God's knowledge in the first place. It's His book and His wisdom. This is the, minds, the mind of the Lord. You're only wise because He taught you these things. You're only wise because He wrote these things down in a book and allowed you to learn them and then gave you His Holy Spirit, the indwelling of that, to lead you into these truths. To teach you these things. He already built the house for you. The vineyard was already there. It was all laid out. You just had to go eat of it. Right? Don't we liken this unto the manna? You just had to just take parts of it. That's it. So we, we can become puffed up, but when you really stop and you look around, what really, what really do you have to boast about? Nothing. All the things that you get access to, they're all things that God created in the first place. Bread, all of these types of things. Ultimately, everything goes back to God. So we have no reason to be puffed up. You have, there's nothing that you have in your life that, that should cause you to be puffed up. The first sign of complacency is your heart being lifted up from what? From blessings. From blessings. Now these can be, like I said, oftentimes they're likened to physical blessings. But we need to be careful because just because we don't go down that road, you may have your own little road over here of, of maybe God blesses you spiritually. You know, maybe you, you know, live in a trailer the rest of your life, but you, you know, are blessed with just extreme Bible knowledge. You know, what that may, you know what that may cause to happen to you? You may think, well, look how wise I am. You better remember that God's the one that, that led you there in the first place through His Holy Spirit. God's the one that, that saved you, gave you the Bible, and gave you His wisdom in the first place. Always we need to make sure that we, everything we're doing, that we're giving glory to God. We're not becoming complacent or content in our lives. I want you to go with me to 2 Chronicles chapter number 12. 2 Chronicles chapter number 12. We'll see a couple of people in the Old Testament as examples here. Leaders that uh, became lifted up with pride and, and uh, forsook the Lord because of it. Look at a couple of them real quick. One of them is Rehoboam. Uh, very well known. The son of Solomon. Look here at 2 Chronicles chapter number 12. Look at verse number 1. It says this, And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom. Now watch this. And had strengthened himself. He forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. That one thing you can learn from this is the importance of having a leader, a strong leader, because notice what happened. It says, he forsook the law of the Lord, and then it says this, and all Israel with him. You know, it's sad, but when a leader falls, most of the time the people fall as well. That's just how things work, right? That's why God set, sets up and desires to have a strong leader in position of power. But also, there's other things you can learn from this as well. Here's the thing, you know, obviously I preached extremely long sermons, you know, uh, or ex many sermons recently on the subject of, I have preached extremely long sermons before as well, but yeah, that's right, amen, right? But, you know, there's, you know, I've, I've, I've preached many sermons right in a row, like three or four sermons on the subject of specifically church leadership recently, right? And one of the things that I spoke about repeatedly is the importance of having a strong leader. I talk about how God desires for there to be a strong leader in the position. Uh, he wants to set a man over the congregation, right? And people have, have tried to attack that from one angle to the next. And one of the things that people bring up all the time is they're like, well, what happens if that guy goes bad? Do you know what you do? It's real simple. If I become extremely corrupt and I'm just like this wicked, evil monster, do you know what you do? Anybody, take a guess. Leave. Is that hard to figure out? Go find another good church. That, it's that simple. It's that easy. Don't go down with me. All right? Let me sink on the boat myself. If a boat is sinking and the captain is bad and he's like, hey, I'm going to wreck this thing. I'm going to kill everybody on it. Just, just get off the boat. That's what you do. That, it's that simple. It's that easy. So you know what you need to do is you need to be, you need to not be just completely, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be dependent upon your leader for your own Christian walk, right? 
You shouldn't be dependent upon you know, his interpretations, him teaching you the Bible. Hey, I teach you a lot of things, but you're supposed to be a Berean and trying everything that I say. And listening and hearing it, receiving it, the Bible says, but then also you know, searching the scriptures to see if those things are so. So what happens is oftentimes, like in this situation, when the leader goes down and then the people go down too with them, what happens is they were blindly following that leader. They were just going to do whatever he did. They weren't following the Lord with their first priority, right? They were blindly following that man is what they were doing. So when he went down, they went down as well because they weren't thinking for themselves, right? So notice here what happened that when he was strengthened, it says he strengthened himself, it says he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel. And what happened? He was lifted up. Now in this case it says that he strengthened himself. I want you to go to 2 Chronicles chapter number 26, verse number 15. 2 Chronicles chapter number 26, verse number 15. Because of that smart comment, I think I'll go on for another hour tonight. No, I'm just kidding. 2 Chronicles chapter number 26, verse number 15. The Bible says, he made, And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men. Lost my spot. Where am I at? Where was I at? Verse 15. To be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones with awe. And then it says this, And his name spread far abroad. What's that mean? It became popular. He, gained it, he grew in notoriety. A lot of people knew who he was, right? People knew his name. What happened? He was lifted up because of that. Look what it says. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped. And then it says this, till he was strong. Notice that. He was marvelously helped till he was strong. Verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. So notice how here his heart's lifted up and because of that he's trying to step into a position that he does not deserve. He's not the priest. He's going way outside of his bounds. Why? Because he's, he's growing in pride. His heart is lifted up. What was the reason why his heart became lifted up? Because he, was, he had a lot of power. Now where did he get the power from? It says... It doesn't tell you specifically. It's obviously easy to imply, but it says, For he was marvelously helped. That's why his name was spread abroad and he did all these things. It says, For he, for he was marvelously helped. And it says, Till he was strong. Verse 16, But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God. Who was helping him? What was the reason why he had this strength in the first place? So that he was growing. Because of the Lord. Because God was blessing him. It wasn't just him on his own. It was the Lord was there and He was the one that was, that was helping him. He was marvelously helped in a great, you know, amazing way, if you will, right? He was helped. And then it says this, till he was strong. It means once he became strong, what happened? Just like with Rehoboam. It says he, was lifted up, he lifted up himself in his strength, right? And then it says that he fell and all the people with him. Why? Because he was, he was complacent. He felt like he didn't need the Lord anymore. I want you to go with me now to, uh, it's going to be the last passage I believe we go to. Go to, go to, go to we'll go to one other place. Go to Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 4. I mentioned this earlier, but I, wanna, I do want to go ahead and turn there. Go to the book of Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number 4, verse number 11. The real famous verse that says this, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now, of course, this is speaking about physical needs. It says in verse 12, I know, I know both <clears throat> how to be a base and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. If we back up to verse number uh, 9 and 10, he's actually talking about them sending him things, things that he needs, right? Physical things in this specific passage. Now, right here we're told that physically, in the things that we have physically, we should just be content with that, right? We should be content with whatever God gives us and blesses us with, you know, based upon His own will. We should be content with that, whatever situation we find ourselves in. I want you to look over at Philippians chapter number 3, though. Here's an area we are, where we are not to be content, and that's in our spiritual walk. We are not to be complacent 
in our spiritual walk. You can be complacent, and you should be complacent or content would be a more proper word, but if you'd like to parallel these even stronger, complacent or content with the things you have in your physical blessings. But you should never be content. You should never be complacent in your spiritual life, in your spiritual walk. Look at Philippians chapter number 3. Look at verse number 9 first. It says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Verse 10. It says, That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Watch verse 11 though. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And then now watch Paul's attitude, what he says here. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. Then he says this. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So notice that he's already, through Christ Jesus, apprehended under the resurrection of the dead. But on top of that, him personally, his righteousness alone, the way that he lives his life, he says, I'm following after. I'm trying to attain unto that goal of Christ Jesus. Look at the next verse, very famous verse. It says in, we'll read verse 13 and then verse 14. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So what he's saying, he's saying, hey, I obtained through the resurrection of the dead because I have his righteousness. Now the passage in its full, full context is Paul talking about all of his own righteousness in the beginning, right? He's talking about, hey, I did this, uh, you know, the stock of, 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 of uh, Benjamin, right? He's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He just, he just sits there and boasts in all the things that he had in his own righteousness. But then he says, I count all these things but dung that I might obtain Christ Jesus. And he says, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So his salvation is what? Through putting his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and receiving Christ's righteousness. Now, that which he was obtained of Christ Jesus, or through Christ Jesus in his salvation... He has Christ's righteousness. But does that just make him content, hey, I'm saved? He's like, no, I'm following after that which I have been attained of through him. I still want to press forward. And he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, obviously, are we ever going to be like Christ in, his, in our fullest while we're on this earth, in ourselves, in our own righteousness? No. But should you be satisfied and happy with where you are? Just because you're saved, just because you have His righteousness, right? Wherever you're at, maybe, you know, maybe you're saved and, and you are quite down the road, pretty far down the road in your Christian walk. But does that mean you should be satisfied with where you are? No. You should press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Look at what he says in verse 15. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. He's saying a person that would be perfect or complete, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So notice he says, if a person is perfect, as many as would be complete or perfect, let them be thus minded. What is he saying? Let them have this type of mind. What's the mind? Notice, I haven't attained yet. If a person says, I'm good, you, you know what you're proving to me? You haven't attained. You're not there yet. It's like what Job said. It just popped into my mind. I'm not going to quote it correctly. But he said... If I, you know, if, if I with my own mouth say that I am perfect, I'm proving myself that I'm not. I'm proving that I'm not. If you say, hey, look at my Christian walk, I've attained, you're showing me that you haven't. You're proving to me that you haven't. Yes, we attain through Christ Jesus. We have our righteousness through Christ. We're going to heaven one day. But you know what you need to do? You need to try to follow after for what Christ attained for you. Try to follow after that. Try to, do, try, try to follow after Christ's example, the life that He lived on this earth. Don't be satisfied and happy with your salvation. Don't be satisfied and happy with the things that you have right now. You know, a man that is complete and perfect would be the man that's like, hey, I haven't made it. I haven't made it. When he doesn't even know, hey man, you know, obviously not perfect in the sense that without sin. Complete. That's the man. The man that would say, I'm not perfect, I'm not complete. That would be the man that is complete. That would be a part of the, 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 the whole scope of the character of a man that's that way. You know why? Because he's humble. He's not lifted up. He's not complacent. He's continually moving forward. 
What's Paul doing? All the time in Paul's writings, he's talking about how he's moving forward. He's, he's running a race. He's moving forward. He's not complacent. He's not content. He's not standing still. We're going to end in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Go there. That's where we were going to go to begin with. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is be the last place we turn to. 1 Corinthians 10. I'm going to read you from an Old Testament passage where God is uh, buking Israel again. He's talking about people that are content. It says this in Amos chapter number 6, verse number 1. Woe to, woe to them that are at ease in Zion. So he's speaking to those that are in Jerusalem, of course, right? Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came. It says this, That lie upon beds of ivory, and stretch themselves upon their couches, and eat the lambs out of the flock, and the calves out of the midst of the stall, that chant to the sound of the vial and invent the, to themselves instruments of music like David. Notice that what do they have? They're full, aren't they? And what, what did he say they were? They were at ease. They were complacent. They were happy with where they were. And he goes on and on and on. We'll skip that. I want you to look here at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Look at me, a real famous verse. Major warning, same warning of the Old Testament that we read many times. It's a very popular, well-known verse. Look here with me at verse number 12. Look at verse number 11 first. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. So it was examples, the things of the Old Testament, the being punished and things of that nature. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Now, notice that the warning is given to the man that thinks that he stands. Because what's going to happen if you think that you stand? You will fall. The man that thinks that he atta has attained, has not attained. Right? Rick, get your kid. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the man that thinks that he has attained, has not attained. The man that, let me tell you this, the man that thinks he stands, I'm good. I don't need anything. I'm rich. Right? I have gold. I am in need of nothing. You do not stand. That's the man that needs to be the most wary. That's the man that needs to watch out the most. Right? That's the man that needs to take heed to the warning even more so. The man that thinks that he's perfect is not perfect. If you go into these Baptist churches, you start speaking to all these people, they're all satisfied with where they are in their Christianity. They're all happy. They could die in five years and it doesn't even phase them. Never be that Christian. Where you're just satisfied with where you are. You're just happy with where you are. I don't need your gold. I don't need your eye salve. I don't need your ointment. I don't need your white raiment. If that is you, Christ is not happy with you. If that is you, if that ever becomes you, just keep in mind Christ is not happy with you. You know, you need to remember the warnings of these things. Hey, if you ever start to obtain to great you know, wealth, or if you ever start to obtain to great power, or if you ever start to have something creep into your life that, hey, maybe you, you know, you know, you grow in great knowledge and wisdom or whatever it may be, you grow in notoriety in whatever way that it may be. Whatever it is, you better watch out. Because every time that that's about to happen, somebody's given a warning. You better watch out. You know why? Look all throughout the Bible, my friend. Every time, basically, someone is given power, they become corrupt. Almost every time. Almost exclusively. To some degree, even David, you know, fell because of the power that he was given. It always happens. Because your heart becomes lifted up. You become complacent and happy with where you are. Even when David stayed back in his sin, that everybody remembers it, that, 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 you know, you know, really outside of that, it was only his, real, it was his really bad, uh, uh, grievous sin that he committed. He lived a very righteous life outside of that. I mean, he had some other things, but that's, that was major, right? But even David, in his life, when that sin occurred, where was he? He stayed back while they went forth to war. What's that sound like? It sounds like he's pretty content. Sounds like he's pretty complacent. Sounds like the rich man, what was he doing? Take thy knees. Rest. We're good. I'm good, man. What mental state was David in when he, when he committed the grievous sin of his life? That, that, I mean, that was a major fall for David. That was horrible. That was the worst time of David's life. What state was he in? He was in a state of complacency. 
Why is the nation of Israel, what's the warning to the nation of Israel every time they're going to be kicked out? God's going to come in and they're going to be all these vast plagues and, and you know, horrible things are going to happen to them. What kind of state does God say they'll be in? Right before this, you're full. And because of that, you become complacent. Just even as, as, as I said, I'll end on this note, to make it applicable if, if you never you know, grow to great wealth, right? Even if you, just living as I said, as Americans, we're full. Your cup runs over. You have, you have a lot even now. It's even, it's very, it would be even easy for you now just to get a cush job, never maybe to become rich or wealthy, but to be able to just provide for your family easily. Right? It would be very easy. Do you know what the next step would be? Your heart to be lifted up, become complacent, and say, I'm good. I don't, you know, I'm good on this area of my Christian walk, soul winning. I'm good on reading my Bible. I'm good on Bible memorization. I'm good on my character as far as charity, hospitality. No, you're not. You're proving to me by your own mouth that you're not. You're proving to me that you have areas where you lack. When you're saying you're perfect, out of your own mouth, you're proving that you're not. This is a major fall. When Christians, when Christians, I mean, we look at the seven churches, and the, the problem with one of the churches is summarized in one word, complacency, in the book of Revelation. The problem with one of the churches in the book of Revelation is complacency. Help us to, you know, watch out for the, warn, the warnings and the signs of possible embarking complacency. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word.